Several weeks ago, I reviewed the first ever Survivor Series pay-per-view, which famously ran on the same Thanksgiving day as Starcade 1987. Now, it would have made a lot of sense for me to review both those shows back to back or maybe within a week of each other, but that's why I'm called the influencer, not the planner. That being said, time for me to finally look back at the other side of that fateful evening, looking at NWA Starcade 87, Shy Town Heat Glory Bound from November 26 at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago, Illinois. This show was nominated by Mike Thomas and Roberto Alex Gonzalez over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. So what's going on in the world of wrestling at this point? I already gave you a little bit of background with the Survivor Series 87 review, but here's a little more from the JCP side of things. Now, as Vincent Mann and the World Wrestling Federation was continuing their expansion, JCP thought it was best to try and stay in the race however they could. Around this time, the company bought out Bill Watts' UWF promotion, taking all their titles and their debt, not unlike what AEW did this year with Ring of Honor. JCP also purchased the UWF's syndicated TV time slots in several markets around the country. This was basically their attempt at trying to counteract and compete against the World Wrestling Federation. Joining forces with the NWA and the UWF, the plan was to make the Wrestling Network. And so because of this desire to expand their market and their reach and appear more national, the decision was made to run Starcade in Chicago. Now, Chicago was a great city for JCP. They'd always done good business there. Several consecutive sellouts in the UIC Pavilion leading up to this show. So filling out that arena wasn't going to be a problem. The real problem, though, was that this move angered a lot of the down-home fans, the hardcore fans of JCP in that whole territory in the southeastern United States. Starcade had always been previously run in Greensboro, North Carolina and or Atlanta, Georgia, and so this is the first time the show runs that far north. Now, it's worth pointing out that storyline-wise, character-wise during this time, JCP, in my opinion, is beating the piss out of the World Wrestling Federation. Having just watched a bunch of Build a Survivor Series 87, followed with a bunch of Build a Starcade 87, I mean, to me, there's no question in terms of the content and the action and the stories and what people are talking about and the builds here. It just makes a lot more fun television and more compelling product to see what the NWA is doing compared to what the WWF is doing with their kind of cartoon, cookie cutter style of presentation. But both shows are generally being entertaining in their own ways, and so you would think with both shows airing on one night, that's a lot of potential for a lot of entertainment for the fans. But of course, as the story goes, Vincent Mann threatened the cable companies not to run Starcade, or they wouldn't get WrestleMania for the next year, which resulted in a terrible buy rate of about 20,000 buys for Starcade. But in an alternate timeline, it's fun to think about a chance in which the cable companies just said no and called Vince on his bluff with that ultimatum, because yeah, if he really committed to that, then those cable companies might not get WrestleMania for but then again, those companies wouldn't run WrestleMania 4. And I think that Vince would be in a similar situation the following year than he, the JCP was in late 87. They wouldn't have a whole lot of platforms to promote their big show on, which would have cost them. So it's interesting to think about what might have happened had the cable companies put their foot down and had a little more power over Vince instead of the other way around, but so is life. 8,000 folks in attendance here. There are some visibly empty seats, but the show is considered a sellout. Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross on the call for this one. Your opening match is some six-man action as Michael Hayes, Jimmy Garvin, and Sting takes on Larry Zbysko, Eddie Gilbert, and Rick Steiner. Sting is a relative newcomer to the NWA. He was with UWF for a while, recently showing up in JCP about a month ago, and boy, he is a huge ball of energy here, and it won't be long before he is considered one of the top guys in the company. Sting's a house of fire at the start, hits a big old missile dropkick, and the Stingbirds stand tall early on. Guys like Zbysko and Gilbert keep getting in the wrong corner, and they pay for it. Good job by the announcers explaining the ties Sting has to guys like Gilbert and Rick Steiner, how they used to all be on the same team, so to speak. The baddies take over on Jimmy Jam Garvin as we get the rare seven-minute time call by the ring announcer. Rick Steiner is all power. Huge power slam on Jimmy. Zabisco gets the abdominal stretch locked in, but Garvin escapes. Tags in the Stinger, but Sting's momentum is snuffed out thanks to some referee distraction. Two minutes to go here. Sting tagging in P.S. Hayes, who goes wild, hits the Bulldog on Zabisco, who does a great sell of that. He gets his foot in the ropes, though. More multi-man madness. Gilbert decks Hayes from behind with the referees occupied. Michael tries but fails to win in time, and the match ends in a time limit draw. I give it one and a half stars out of five. At least the fans were into this thing the whole way through. I kind of noticed this phenomenon the more I've been watching Freebirds matches from this era. Whether they're face or they're heel, no matter where in the country they're working, they're going to get some of the loudest and most boisterous response from the crowd you will ever get on any given show. I think all the guys in this match individually performed well, but together
together. It just didn't mesh into a good cohesive story, in my opinion. And I tell you what, nothing quite sets the tone for a show like a time limit draw in the opening match. Missy Hyatt backstage in her one and only appearance in the evening reporting from the promo zone. She plugs the main event of Flair and Garvin, seems to forget her place, then tosses back to Tony and Jim. Well, not unlike what's happening in today's current landscape with AEW having purchased Ring of Honor and all their championships, with the buyout of the UWF from Jim Crockett, you see a lot of influx of talent and championships making their way to the NWA programming, which brings us this match here for the UWF Heavyweight Championship as Dr. Death Steve Williams takes on Barry Windham, who is the current NWA Western States Heritage Champion. Both men are baby faces and are friends, and they both have made it clear that, hey, you know what? We're still friends before and after the match, but when that bell rings, it's all about the gold. Yay, sportsmanship, and you cannot convince me that this man is 27 fucking years old. Dr. Death showing the power early on. Big hip toss and a press slam that Barry fights out of. They tussle to the outside, but they stop themselves from brawling. The fans don't care for that, but I thought that was a great touch given their relationship. The graps continue. Steve goes for a leapfrog, but Barry stays up and basically headbutts his opponent in the groin, which looked amazing. Barry even gives Steve a minute to catch his breath. Barry goes for a cross body, but Steve ducks a huge tumble to the outside. Barry gets back in the ring and Wyndham just rolls him up and that's it. Wow, kind of a shocker that Dr. Death didn't give Wyndham the same grace that Barry gave him earlier. I really like the whole hesitant fighting on the outside, the shaking the hand before the match, sportsmanship, yay, rah, rah, and that whole twist of, of Steve Williams not giving Barry Wyndham the same kind of time to recover that Barry gave Steve. And I think this does a good job setting up toward a, a Williams heel turn down the line. But yeah, it's like, mm, there wasn't much to it besides that. And if, it, if there was more to it besides those two pivotal points, then I think it would have been rated a bit higher. It's time for the return of one of the wildest and most dangerous, unnecessary matches in wrestling history, the Scaffold Match, or here it's called the Skywalkers Match, as the Midnight Express take on Rock and Roll, a rematch from 84. The Midnight are the U.S. Tag Team Champions, but the belts aren't on the line here, because the whole thing is that Rock and Roll Express, they're sick of Midnight, and they're sick of Jim Cornette getting in their business and costing them matches, which leads to this one here. The guys start climbing their way up, but then suddenly Ricky Morton goes after Cornette. That leads to Big Bubba hitting Morton with the Bubba slam in the ring. Gibson all by himself on that scaffold for a couple of minutes. Bubba looks to climb up as well, but Morton whacks the hell out of him with the tennis racket. The crowd goes nuts. All four men finally up top now. We get some close calls, some body parts dangling. Suddenly, Bobby Eaton's produced a bag full of blow. I mean, salt in the eyes. The racket keeps coming into play. Midnight looking good for a while. Gibson counters with a piece of railing from the scaffold itself. Gibson and Eaton are brawling up top as Stan Lane and Morton fight underneath. Lane tries to do the monkey bar thing, but he's the first to fall. Bobby getting a good spanking courtesy of Ricky with that racket. Eaton getting decked from all sides now as he's hanging on for dear life before finally falling. Rock and roll win the match. Afterward, though, Cornette ordering Big Bubba to go up there and take care of things. Morton's not backing down, but hey, who's the boss? Tony Danza. Rock and roll escape, and they still win. I give this one three stars out of five. You know what? As one-dimensional as the scaffold match is, as narrow, figuratively and literally, as this match type is, I had a great time watching. I think they told a great story. I mean, there was some real-life peril in there to really make you feel for them. There was drama. There was a little bit of humor peppered in there. I, for, from my perspective, I gotta give it to them. They really made this one work for me. I, I don't really care for scaffold matches, but these guys made it work. Of course, with Midnight and Rock and Roll, what else could you ask for? They make everything work. Bob Cottle backstage with the Freebirds, dressed to kill, and Michael Hayes is apparently mute as Garvin does all the talking for this portion of the backstage segment. He breaks down all the big matches still to come tonight that fans have already paid to see. Talks about wanting the tag team title shot at some point. Putting over Jim Crockett Promotions as the winning team. The NWA is the best. He even pulls a Snitsky here and says, it's not my fault when my brother Ronnie wins the championship match against Ric Flair in the main event. Speaking of which, side note, they're billed as like KFA brothers here at this time. But then I found out that Ronnie Garvin is actually uh, Jim Garvin's stepfather. That's, that's a weird relationship. The Freebirds go to leave. Then comes Dr. Death Steve Williams. This 27-year-old man says, despite what happened in the match, it's all about the gold. And like how the Sooners came from behind the football game last week, he came from behind to win tonight and will do anything to protect the UWF title. The guys on commentary continue to stall as the scaffold's being taken down. A lot of dead air. You know I love that stuff. Then it's time for a unification match for the world television titles. It's UWF versus NWA as Terry Taylor battles Nikita Koloff. The feud began because recently Taylor just showed up on TV and stole the physical title from Nikita for a while. And I gotta say, this is peak Terry Taylor in my opinion. Cocky heel, working with Eddie Gilbert, someone he actually had 
had some good on air chemistry with. Also, I have to say this I have never seen any Eddie Gilbert stuff outside of what I'm watching here at 87. I'm aware of his creative prowess in UWF and then later in ECW in the early days. I know he died tragically young. I don't, I've never seen any other matches besides what we saw in the opener here and what we saw here in this and the build for this show. See, no Eddie Gilbert stuff, and I know I'm kind of ignorant to that, and I apologize for it. If any of you have any good Gilbert matches or promos you want to send my way to let me know what I'm missing out on, please let me know. Also, I have to point out, it's kind of weird seeing a young Earl Hebner involved in this matchup here. Nikita overpowering Taylor early on, throwing him around by the arm. Terry spending a whole long time just getting his ass kicked in the early going, being extremely vocal as he does. He takes a lot of offense, but he finally dodges the sickle attempt. Nikita takes himself out. Taylor starts to fight dirty and aggressive as he works the left arm, but JR points out that Nikita throws the sickle with his right. Nikita comes back with a corner punches, Earl getting involved at one point because of course he did. By the end, both guys look like a million bucks in this thing. Nikita looks like this badass Taylor, this arrogant cheating prick. Hot stuff Eddie Gilbert attacking Nikita off camera, and that leads to a figure four with the assist. Hebner breaks it up. We get chaos on the apron. Taylor and Gilbert collide. The sickle and the win. Nikita Koloff has unified the two TV titles. I give it three and a half stars out of five, and it's actually my pick for the best match of the night. Now, I wouldn't have said that in the first half of this thing because it was pretty slow going, but once Taylor gets his heat in and starts getting really aggressive and it becomes more of a match and some back and forth, it becomes really intense and really fun to watch. It was this kick-ass physical fight by the end with the cheating and it getting thwarted and whatnot. I think it's the best Nikita Koloff match I've seen since I've been doing these reviews, and it's one of the best, if not the best, Terry Taylor match I've seen from this time period as well. We go backstage to find Jack Gregory and Magnum TA with an update from the Wrestling Network. Of course, Magnum TA suffering the career-ending car accident in 1986, out of wrestling for good after that, at least the in-ring competition, but he did a pretty good job as a commentator later on after his retirement for Jim Crockett Promotions. I think he was great as a color man during this time. Then we go to the NWA World Tag Title match as Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard of the Horsemen defend against the Road Warriors. Animal and Hawk at this time have been World Six Man Tag Champs with Dusty Rhodes for like 100 years at this point. That belt is pretty stagnant, but they have never won the World Tag Team Championships before, and they say it's their destiny to do so in this, their hometown of Chicago. Hawk begins things with a goozle showing off the power. We get some words exchanged with Paul Ellering and J.J. Dillon on the outside. We almost get a manager fight, but the boys break it up. Tully getting thrown all over the place, gets caught in midair and hit with a power slam. Arn and Tully make Animal and Hawk look great here. Even more press slams, but suddenly Hawk's leg is targeted with the referee distracted. Tully whacking Hawk in the leg with a chair. I love this save from the hot tag by Arn here. Arn takes one right in the yam bags. That allows Animal to tag in. He's on a roll. Referee Tommy Young gets shit canned to the outside. Arn thrown over the top rope. Blanchard's taken out. A doomsday device to Arn. The Road Warriors with the cover and the win. They win the tag titles. Or do they? The decision's reversed because Young says he saw Arn get thrown over the top rope. You better believe that's a disqualification. That means the horsemen walk out of Chicago, still the tag champs. I give this one two and a half stars out of five. I think the Road Warriors are still fairly rough to watch at times in this thing, but I think that Tully and Arn do such a good job making these guys look like a million bucks, like absolute stars. And I think that the, the heartbreaking dusty finish in this thing, like it's disappointing. And I, when you look at it as part of a greater thing on the show, might have been nice to have a, a nice moment with Animal and Hawk actually winning the belts and keeping it that way. But I think it just adds the drama and the heartbreak of the match itself. I think it just made an overall good package. We hear again from Jack Gregory and Magnum TA, then Bob Cottle backstage with the new unified TV champion, Nikita Koloff. What do you got to say for yourself, champ? I'm detecting hints of like the Cookie Monster, maybe a little bit of Dusty Rhodes, and like some Mankind grunts in this promo for Nikita. And after listening to this one specific, I, I'd heard Nikita Koloff promos before this, but it sounds really just completely exaggerated here. And I realized listening to this, oh my God, Nikita Koloff must have been an early inspiration for the Strong Mad voice. I can be the quietest mouse! I live in the quietest house! 
In comes J.J. Dillon. He's breathing a sigh of relief over what happened with the tag titles, and he believes that Lex Luger will put Dusty Rhodes away tonight. On we go to the cage match for the NWA U.S. title in the total package defense against the American Dream, Luger versus Dusty. Luger beat Nikita Koloff in July to win his first U.S. championship. Not his longest individual reign, but his first reign here. He's called out Dusty for this match here, and the big emotional selling point, far greater even than the U.S. title being on the line, is that if Dusty loses, he must quit wrestling for 90 days. They treat it like a big deal at this time. Obviously, the wrestling landscape's a lot different in 1987 than it is in, say, 2022. If you miss a wrestle for 90 days, you almost blink and you miss it. It's not almost like that big a deal. But here, it's, you know, oh my God, if you don't wrestle for 90 days, like your, your muscles atrophy and you get, uh, you get out of the loop, you're too rusty and you lose money and that could be a death to your career. I gotta tell you, I don't approve of Lex coming out with a robe during this time in his career. I don't think Lex is a robe guy. I think you wear a big robe like that. Number one, so many people in the 80s had robes like that, so you fail to stand out in that way. But also, you're covering up the goods. What makes you a big attraction is the jacked muscles and the ripped physique. You're covering up with the robe, man. What are you doing, Lex? And on the outside, Johnny Weaver holds the key to the cage to ward off the horsemen. Weaver was recently woven into the storyline with Dusty here because uh, in the build-up to this show at Starcade, uh, the horsemen brought in Hiro Matsuda, and so he was kind of working under J.J. Dillon. Matsuda's got his own version of the Weaver Lock, which is basically a sleeper hold, and there's a demonstration where he shows off making Tommy Young pass out with the sleeper hold, and then Johnny Weaver gets involved, Matsuda puts the hold on him and makes him pass out, he's bleeding from the mouth, this very emotional, dramatic moment that Dusty makes the save for is David Crockett screaming, let him go, let him go, and so that's why Weaver is at this point here, because he's helping Dusty in his fight against the Horsemen. Some early posturing, Lex does his flex, Dusty has some fun with that in response, Dusty with the flip flop and fly and the Weaver lock is locked in a couple of times, but Luger escapes. Big scream by Luger here as he misses an elbow. <laughs> Dusty works the arm for the longest time, but Luger with one shot is able to turn things around. He drives Dusty into the cage, and now Rhodes is bleeding. Luger goes to the torture rack, gets the big man up there, but Dusty's able to fight it. Still on the defensive, though. Luger attacks the arm for several minutes. Finally, Dusty fires up out of the corner. The Weaver lock again in the middle of the ring, but then J.J. Dillon takes out Weaver, throws a chair into the ring as the referee's been knocked out. Luger takes his sweet time with the chair. Rhodes hits a DDT and pins to win the match, and the U.S. title for the first time. Dusty's career is safe. I give it one and a half stars out of five. There was some good drama in this thing. I think it was a little formulaic. I think that there was a bit too many arm holds in this uh, steel cage match for my liking. I think that it was also an odd choice for Dusty to go over on, you know, the upstart, the, the up and coming young talent at this time, even though Luger's a heel. I guess in the grand landscape of things, if the Road Warriors can't win the U.S. Uh, or the World Tag titles, then Dusty can win the U.S. title. And I guess that makes it even, I suppose. Uh, they would go on to do the whole, is Dusty going to stay in wrestling or not thing, because in 88, Dusty Rhodes would lose a retirement match and then come back as the Midnight Rider. So this match here with Dusty winning staves off that a little bit. Now it's time to keep the cage up because it's time for our main event for the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship as rugged Ronnie Garvin hands a stone defense against the nature boy Ric Flair. About a month ago, Garvin beat Flair in an upset in the cage to win his first and his only world championship. Garvin was essentially put in that role, though, because Dusty as the booker at the time, he didn't want himself or any other promising baby faces like Nikita Koloff or Barry Windham to kind of lose their luster if they win the belt here and drop it right back away to Flair at Starcade. Oh, perhaps I said too much already. And the build of this is great because Flair is totally the odd man out as the challenger, the person not the champion, and he's going on about how, you know, you're only making money when you're the champion. My lifestyle is being threatened here. My way of life is being threatened because Ronnie Garvin holds that belt, and so I'm going to do everything I can to win it back. Both men start off intense when the match begins. Garvin throwing those stone-like hands to a chorus of Garvin sucks chance. Uh-oh. Flair flops early as Garvin keeps the offense going. He does the Garvin stomp, which gets a big pop, so I'm very confused. Flair with an inverted atomic drop, which sends Garvin crumbling. Flair on the attack gets the figure four locked in, and after much fighting, they get into the ropes. Garvin blocks the cage attacks and throws Flair into the wall multiple times, even biting him. Flair starts to bleed. Good thing he's wearing white trunks. Flair thrown off 
the top, and now he's in the figure four. Garvin goes up top, hits a big cross body. We only get a two count. Both men go into the top, fighting on the cage wall. Flair is crotched. More fighting. Flair throws Garvin post to post and into the referee. We get the big punch by Garvin, but there's a two count. Garvin throws head first into the cage. Flair covers and wins to regain the title to a huge ovation, making Flair a five-time world champ. Remember when that was considered a lot? And wait, who's the babyface here again? I'll give it two and a half stars out of five. Not the strongest main event in the world. There were a couple of matches in the undercard that I thought were better and more entertaining, but this one still did a pretty good job. Got a little repetitive at times, though, when it was just trading strikes over and over again. I mean, even for a Flair match, it seemed kind of excessive. Though I did like the finish, though. I think it was a good clean win for Flair. Flair. Garvin still looking relatively good in defeat, like he wasn't outmaneuvered or outsmarted or he wasn't cheated. He was just driven face first into the steel post that knocked him out. So I think there's a pretty good job protecting him, but that is the last time you will ever see Hands of Stone in a world title predicament ever again. My grade for Starcade 87, Shy Town Bound, Glory Heat, or maybe it's the other way around, is a C minus. This show is just kind of middle of the road for me. I felt that there were a lot of matches. Well, the matches I liked the most are on this show were the ones I expected to like the least. So I think that was a nice welcome surprise. Uh, this one, comparing it to Survivor Series 87, even though Survivor Series was all just one kind of match, and I will give Starcade credit for having a wider variety of talent and match types in here, I think that, and even though JCP had the better TV product at the time, I think Survivor Series was actually a stronger pay-per-view than what we saw here because there were a couple of duds on this show. I don't know if removing the UWF aspect of things would have helped Starcade. I don't think that, you know, it certainly wasn't a location thing. Chicago was hot for it the whole time. It was in a city where they drew and they sold out. So that wasn't an issue. I just think maybe the choices they made on this show, one or two things could have made it a little bit better in my opinion. But yeah, I think Survivor Series comparing the two shows on Thanksgiving night, 87, I think Survivor Series gets the nod in my opinion. Of course, this was the beginning of the end for JCP. Jim Crockett leveraged just about everything he had on the success of the Wrestling Network and their pay-per-view debut on Starcade. It was the financial failure of this event that led to Crockett Promotions being purchased by Ted Turner, giving us WCW. And now you know the rest of the story. Well, folks, you don't have to wait two weeks for the next classic review because all this month in December, it's all classic pay-per-reviews, and we are focusing the rest of our month on December-themed pay-per-reviews. And folks, I have got to see this one through to the very end of the year. After seeing everything we saw at Survivor Series 99, I have got to know who is going to win the battle for Stephanie McMahon's love, Triple H or Vince McMahon. I'm talking about Armageddon 99. But until then, folks, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.